All right. Thank you, Scott. It's good work with those. Friends, we are beginning a sermon series today. It's going to last three weeks, and uh, it's about membership expectations. This is generally the time of year when the church pauses to do a focus on uh, stewardship, and we build a budget. But, you know, as a, since I've come here, this is my second go-round with this. It's really reloading the gun, preparing for 2016, and getting excited, getting committed, and, and, and focused on what we're going to do. God has uh, overwhelmingly been abundant with us lately, and it's been wonderful to experience. In fact, we have our new chiller operating today, so... He took care of that for us, and through the generosity of the church, it was handled lickety-split. It's been a blessed move. And so every, every uh, year during this time before we start uh, stepping into the next year, we're going to pause and talk about what it means to be a member of Christ's church. You'll also are going to re- receive, if you're a member of the church or if you'd like to receive as a friend, we're sending letters out this week about our, our budgeting strategy so you can see how the, the church you are ministered with um, takes care of the finances that you contribute. You can see how, you know, how the sausage is made, I guess. Uh, in addition, there'll be a pledge card in that letter if you choose to fill it in. Uh, we, we appreciate getting those on or before the first Sunday in November. So we begin our, our sermon series looking at Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 23. May God bless the reading and the hearing, the understanding of these words. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Amen. <clears throat> so I'm a member of uh, a few organizations and clubs. I'm sure most of us in this room are connected to some group uh, beyond just twiddling our thumbs at home. Sometimes your group is your place of work. Uh, if you're like me, <clears throat> you might be a card-carrying holder to Sam's Club. I want to brag, <laughs> but the way this works, if you, uh, if you pay money at the beginning of your year, <clears throat> you have access to a 12-pound cans of tuna and a barrel of mayonnaise, if that's the kind of thing you're after. Uh, I'm an Advantage member, according to my card, and I've started to wonder if that means they're taking advantage of me. Uh, that's the way Sam membership works. It's a very exclusive club. If you'd like, I can put a good word in for you. Uh, we might have to go there in person. So if you could have your references in place, that would be helpful. Uh, but, you know, we as people have a tendency to, to gather together in organizations. Uh, Rotary Club is really big in Lubbock, I've noticed. That's a great group, a philanthropic group. Uh, and sometimes people join a women's club, a country club, a fraternity, a sorority. Uh, a gym. I mean, there's all sorts of organizations you can join. And so as we're focusing on what it means to join the church, there's a major hinge point we have to start with before we take any other steps. When it comes to becoming a, a member of the body of Jesus Christ, there are no exclusive benefits to members. You do not have to be a member of the church to receive the benefits of the church. That's not how the church was built, to hoard benefits. Do you want fellowship? A place to be safe and to be loved on? You don't have to be a member for that. Do you want pastoral care, counseling? Do you want an elder to come visit you when you're sick in the hospital? Elders, do they have to be members? No way. Uh, Maybe you want to be in an engaging Bible study or come to church and hear you know, the best sermon you'll ever hear, right? You don't have to be a member for that. Last time I checked, we don't have people standing at, at the front doors here checking and carding to see if you're carrying your Sam's Club card or not. There are no exclusive benefits to being a member of Christ's church. 
the two basic things that happen when you join a church, number one is that you've put yourself in a position to commit to the church so that we can more easily commit to you. The relationships are just easier to form that way. The second is that you've recognized that you've already have exposure to any benefit you could ever want when it comes to church. And you're ready to live into the expectations of what it means to be a member of the body of Jesus. Out of all the organizations, out of all the, the titles, the, the stuff you can be involved in in your life, the greatest honor is to be counted a friend of Jesus and a member of his church. This is his story right now, you remember? We are a chapter of God's story. And to be part of the church is a powerful move. It's a powerful invitation. And when we're talking about membership, we're, I'm not talking about kind of the, the secular understanding of membership where you actually have a card. That's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches a different concept where when you become a member of the church, you're like a finger or a nose or an ear. You become part of the body of Jesus. So, I mean, technically when some of our members aren't present, we're dismembered. So we remember the church when we come back together an interesting concept that St. Paul taught. So each week we'll be looking at the basic expectations of what it means to join any church, not just First Christian, the biblical expectations. The first is that if you're a member of of a church, you're expected to share your life. It's tempting. I'm an introvert. It's tempting to treat church like you would a movie theater. To sneak in, don't talk to me, and then sneak out. It's all about me and my Jesus. That's not what church is about. The church is not the building, it's the people, remember? If this building were to go away, if the government were to take it or something crazy were to happen, we'd still have a church, okay? So you've got to share your life. That's that's expectation. That's a good expectation. I like that one. Number two is that when God puts something on your heart or an ability in in your soul or a song in your mouth, you are to be a squeaky wheel until that talent is used in the church. Some of y'all have become squeaky wheels. That's what we want. Say, use me, use me. I have this idea. Sometimes it takes time, you know. Take some time, but continue to lobby for the talent and the calling God put on your heart. So number two expectation is that when God speaks to you, if God wakes you up, and here's a holy time at 3.30 in the morning. Y'all been woken up at 3.30 before, unaccounted for? Pay attention. Sit on the edge of your bed and say, speak, I'm listening, Father. When God speaks to you or gives you a a talent, you're to use it in the church. And it's my job as pastor to help find the best fit for that. Number three is that uh, when it comes to church membership, church members are expected to return to God from our finances, what he's given us, to withhold only 90% of his, not 100%. My belief in what Valerie and I have discerned the scriptures to teach is you're supposed to do that through your local church. And we found it helpful to be involved in a congregation where we don't just go to church here and then give our money through Red Cross. We've been fortunate to be attending and part of and a member of a congregation here where we're joyfully able to give back to God through our local church. Two birds, one stone. It's been fun. Number four, and we're only going to be able to do three, so we're not doing this one on this series, but the fourth expectation is if you're going to join a church, you're expected to grow. If you have it all figured out, this is not the church for you. In fact, I don't know a church for you if you've got it all figured out. Maybe go start a church that no one will attend, right? These four expectations increase the integrity of what it means to be a member of the body of Jesus, to live into our covenantal vows. You know, when the Jews were living in the days of the Old Testament, to live into their covenant was the way God performed ministry through them. And for us to live into the expectations the scriptures have on the church is a great, strong means for God to do his work through the power of the Spirit during this chapter. So this morning we're focusing on the first expectation. That's that if you're going to join a church, you're expected to share your life. Remember my brother um, was raised in the disciples movement and and he left and joined the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, he's deeply introverted like I am. And I really am. I know it's kind of a joke, but he uh, called me up a few weeks after starting to attend um, this huge Roman Catholic church. He said, it was great. I went to church and nobody talked to me. 
you know. Nobody mess with me. And I mean, there's a kind of a point. I mean, it is kind of nice to get to go and worship the Father. But there's a, there, there's a piece. Of course, the Catholic Church doesn't intend to do that. Uh, there's a piece that says, while it's nice at times to be left alone and just have you and your Jesus, why join a church then? Why join a, why join a body of believers if you want to be left alone? Sharing your life is part of the deal. In fact, it's the first expectation. Hebrews 10 teaches on this and says that it's important and it's holy and it's pleasing to the Father when we assemble the body, when we get together. Now, when this scripture was read it, written, there were no congregations in this sense with facilities, no sanctuaries. There wasn't a guy up here with a black robe on breaking bread and feeding y'all, okay? Okay. When this scripture was written, it was written to the original intent for the church, which was simply to be a people who lived under the confession that Jesus is who he says he is, and to let the Spirit flow. And so when, Saint, or when, when the Hebrews is teaching to assemble the body, he means get together. Today that would mean do not neglect going to watch a baseball game with one of your brothers or sisters in Christ. Don't let too many weeks go by and fail to go out for a cup of coffee. The friendships you have in your local church are important. I've heard it preached, the scripture, so often, you know, and don't, uh, wait, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves, as some are in the habit of doing. It's usually preached by uh, upset pastors whose churches are shrinking. You know, come to church, got to get to church, you gotta, we need you in church. I've heard them say, you know, if our whole congregation showed up on the same Sunday, this place would be, well, fuller than it is now. <laughs> That's not what the scripture is about. It's not about hoarding people. That's not the point. This holy scripture is about the intentional gathering together in true, the Bible says fellowship, but today it would be friendship, true friendship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't neglect that. Studies show that you can be close to or fairly intimate with 12 to 15 people. It's interesting how many disciples Jesus had, isn't it? I mean, think about your own life. You're, you can be friendly with lots of people, acquaintances with thousands of people, but that intimate kind of other group, there's the select seating. You've got to be selective. You've got to steward that part of your heart. If you're friends with everybody, you're friends with nobody, you know. And so those intimate relationships become important. And you know those relationships. Those are the ones when that person speaks a kind word to you, it hits you better. But they're also in a position to hurt you more than anybody else. Sometimes your family, your blood kin is in there, sometimes not. This expectation simply says, to share your life, it says... Reserve at least two seats out of your 12 for members of the church you attend, for members of the church that you likewise are members of. Don't go to a church where you're not intimate with anybody. If you're already intimate with Christians, go find that church. Go where they're going. Life's too short to keep your life compartmentalized. This is a heavy and a beautiful and an open-handed expectation. Share your life. I came from, and I'm used to, much smaller congregations. Those of you who are visiting, uh, we have multiple services and lots of people. I'm used to 50 to 80 people total. That's like on the Sunday when we serve brisket, you know, everybody comes. That's what I'm used to everyone's, I know their middle name. I could drive to everyone's house by memory uh, as a pastor in Dallas. It's a smaller church. If I chose to, I could sit down and call up every household on the phone in one afternoon to get them all on board for an event. When I came to Lubbock, I realized I couldn't do that. I realized that I can't know everybody, but I can make sure that everybody is known It's not my job. Ain't my job. In fact, I'm bad at it, trying to know everybody. I can't do it. You wouldn't want me to do it. 
You wouldn't want any one individual be responsible for being the intimacy point of this church. The goal is not for the preacher to know everybody or the priest to know everybody. The goal is that everybody's known at First Christian Church. And we've been growing at such a rate. I don't remember, we threw out some numbers this morning and then two more joined. So, hey, maybe I'll try it again, right? We've gained 85, 88 so people in a year. And it's been a great year for our church. And it's been fun. We already had a strong core. But if we don't live into this expectation, y'all, what about all these new folks? I'm spoiled. Preacher's going to have friends when he comes. People are going to pray for my wife. That may not be normal. Having a culture where it's normal, where it's normal to be known, and to make sure that everybody has a chance to be known as well, that's outstanding. That's biblical. And so this expectation to live into as we begin our stewardship series. Y'all are used to seeing a preacher up here talking about money, aren't you? We got to start with your life first. I'll talk about money. You know me. But we got to start with your life first. If you are not committed in relationships to your brothers and sisters in Christ at the church you attend, all the other stuff just doesn't really matter. We're just playing church. But just because a couple of boys are in the backyard building a spaceship doesn't make it a spaceship. You can play church all day, but until the body is assembled in a way that's unified and beautiful, it's wonderful. So in a church this size, for instance, we don't really have, I mean, we have a unified church. We've got one preacher. Well, actually two. Scott nailed it last week. Way to go, Scott. We've got this unified structure, but in reality, on Sunday morning, you have about 20 or 30 small churches. Some of y'all are in Sunday school classes. The choir's a small group. Elders, deacon. We got all these groups, but you know what? Sunday school's not for everybody. You know what? Men's group on Tuesday morning. I love men's group. It's not for everybody. These are valid groups. We need to encourage them. They need to be instilled and and, and steady and beautiful. But we're growing at such a rate. We got to live into this expectation, y'all. Truly extending ourselves, sharing our lives with each other is biblical. Now, the word that hit me in studying this passage was translated to be habit. As some, some people aren't gathering with each other and then, you know... They're not coming to church, and that's when you normally hear this passage, you know. Of course, you're sinning if you don't go to church. I've even heard that before. What a joke. The word habit in Greek simply means ethos. And ethos is most commonly interpreted to mean unspoken etiquette or tribal knowledge. You know that when you... When you you know when you married into that other family? There's some unspoken etiquettes, right? You know when you started working somewhere, there's some unspoken truths. Our staff, for instance, I try to communicate it as clearly as I can. Jonna joined us this past fall, and she knows there's some tribal knowledge about being a member of our team. I went to a friend's church uh, growing up, and I was raised very traditional. My wife's Lutheran, and I'm a kind of traditional disciple, you know, frozen, chosen, sit there, be still, don't talk. Uh, <laughs> It was a great church. That's what I was used to. I went to a friend's church, and at my friend's church, you know, you hold the TV, you pump it, and you do this, you do some of this, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm dressed up ready to be an acolyte, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Nobody said a word to me. Now, of course, I'm, I'm new to this church. It wasn't big, and I was just kind of trying to hide. And enjoy the moment, trying to soak it up, not skip worship, obviously. And they didn't know it, but to them, there was an unspoken etiquette. Nobody say, said anything, nobody gave me a dirty look, but there was a deep, rich, dense peer pressure for me to put my hands in the air. I felt like I was doing something wrong if I didn't. The reverse is true with some people, isn't it? At a traditional church, now, they're going to do what they're going to do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, right? I'm free in the spirit, okay? So if everyone's putting their hands up and I don't want to, I'm just going to put them in my pockets. You, know, you can get over it. But the etiquettes are unspoken, 
But sometimes these unspoken etiquettes, these ethoses, these habits, these cultural norms are the strongest message in the room. You can put up a bulletin board all day saying we're a loving congregation, but when you walk in and it didn't feel loving, right? You know what I'm saying? You can say we're a passionate, a passionate people for Jesus Christ, and there's more tumbleweeds than there are people. Right? I mean, you can say whatever you want. It's the unspoken, powerful norm that's in the room. That's ethos. And so Hebrews is teaching this great threat to the church. He said there are some portions of the body who have normalized not being friends. As some are in the habit of doing. Do not neglect the assembling of yourselves as some are in the habit of doing. Rather get together and spur one another on to love and to good deeds and to holiness. He's writing and saying, don't be that congregation that has in its unspoken culture that you're not supposed to be friends. Don't let your church go down that path. And the reverse is play offense. Make it normal in your unspoken culture that if you are in, in membership at First Christian or, or whatever, if you're visiting here and you live somewhere else, wherever your church is, make it normal that you're going to be known when you come to First Christian. You're going to be known. You're not a number. To, for, for somebody to, to actually feel like, man, if I were to, to, to go through something difficult this week, out of all the people I would call for prayer, one of them would be a member of the church I attend. Share your lives. Some of the strongest relationships many of you have are because of this church. And yet there's plenty of new people like me that want that, that need that. Because life's too short to only kind of be part of a church. Share your lives. And so this week, the challenge is we're talking about stewardship. Forget money right now. I mean, not completely, right? I want you to focus this week simply on this expectation. I want you to focus and say, out of all my intimacy groups, out of all the people I hang out with, is it time for me to prayerfully engage somebody I attend church with and say, hey, I'm looking, you, you just heard the sermon too. What do you say? You want to be my workout buddy? Or I'm going up to the corn maze for the memberships doing a corn maze deal up at Adelu, which is true. We're doing that today. I'm going to be there. I'd like it if you came so we could have some time to get to know each other. It's good that when you go through a personal crisis that you can call your small group before you call me. That's a good thing. That everybody might be known. That's good. That's Christ. So number one, your first goal is to pray and rekindle, or if you're like me, new, establish for the first time these intimate groups that are so needed, that you're hungry for, that Christ's church is hungry for. And number two, set a standard. I've got my standard. It's if I go any two-week period and have not had friendship with one of my brothers and sisters in the Lord, and I mean truth, not where we're talking shop or talking church, but where I can truly just go out and see a movie with somebody or Valerie and I can go on a double date or go see a baseball game. I love Watergate salad and church potlucks, but that's not really how I celebrate friendship. We need to keep doing those things. But I mean natural friendships. Let the Holy Spirit guide you into those relationships. Make it a priority. Set a standard and live into it. This is the year that God's made for us. We had a great last year, didn't we? 2016 is going to be awesome. It's going to be rocking. But we have to live into the expectations to honor the integrity that Jesus Christ set himself up. He paid for this church with his blood. And then he used his spirit to assemble specifically who's here now. Not last year, not next year. Who's here now? You know how marvelous that is? Some of y'all are in town probably traveling for business. They're only going to be here for a month. Boy, that's great. I hope to be here a long time. We're all here temporarily, aren't we? We're going to die at some point. The Spirit's going to call us off at some point. But whoever God has established here now, we are the church. This is the church. We are the ones purchased by the blood. Share your life. 
share it. I say this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.